success ideas. Motivation. Hey! What's up, everyone? All right, great. Um, my role here is to wake you guys up a little bit. Okay, no, I'm gonna be moving around a bit. It's because you see, I was at an Indian wedding last night, so I've got a bit of the, you know, the dancing bug, you know. So I'm sorry about that in advance. Uh, so, what's about the cover? All right. How being a nerd helped me find my identity? I heard someone snicker over there. Okay. So you know. Exponentially, the world is getting globalized as time goes by. Technology has made the world a lot, a lot, a lot more smaller. You can Snapchat someone right now while I'm not looking. But this means, you know, while we gain a lot in commerce and convenience, we actually lose a bit in our individuality. You know, the tints, the colors that make us so special as people. And today, as uh, you know, we've already had a bit of a prior discussion. I'm going to be talking about my identity, who I am. All right, um, sure, individual differences tend to blur out. But how I found my identity in the most unconventional fashion, you probably won't even think about it. I assure you, I'm betting right now. I'm betting my life on this. All right, so this, uh, this sort of thinking inspired me to make a meme, and there'll be a lot of these coming up. So this is a quote by Mark Twain. The two most important days of your life are the day you were born and the day that you find out why. Now, uh, I'm here to tackle a bit of the tougher questions. Um, so, the day you find out why. I think in order to answer this question, we need to answer one more very important question. Who are you? Because only when you know who you are, then you can actually know what you're here for. At least that's how I see it. So I'm here with a question for each and every one of you. And I want you to, you know, keep a note of your answer in the back of your head. Because in case you're old uh, like me, you could actually note it down or something. Uh, I have a bad memory. So the question is, what is the one thing you can live without, but never really live without? All right, does everyone have that down? All right, keep that answer at the back of your head, and let's go full steam ahead. I'm actually here to share with you a tale, a very, very recent incident that happened actually while I was writing this talk. I got into a taxi, and I was going to my gym. And yes, stop looking. Stop looking at me like that. I actually do lift, all right? Okay, I actually do lift, okay? I insist. So the taxi driver asked me a question, a question I've been dealing with for quite a bit. Any guesses? You can just shout it out. Okay, he asked me, where are you from? You know, to you that might be an easy question. To me, I'm British slash Indian slash Hong Konger, so that's not an easy question. That's really not easy. So, I had, a, I had a bit of a think about it. I mean, over the years, I've gotten comfortable with this one answer. So I told him, all hi Hong Kong again. Which translates completely to, I'm a Hong Konger. Do you know what he tells me? No, you're not. Where are your parents from? Yes. Um, so, this is something that people belong to ethnic minorities have to deal with quite often. You know, getting your identity refused. It makes you feel like you're tagged as a second class citizen. And that's something I deal with on a regular basis. You know, being on a packed train where nobody wants to sit next to you, uh, or on a bus. You know, eventually you put your bag next to you and, and you know, lounge around and be like, yeah, this is the life, bro. But it doesn't exactly feel good. So this is actually what the Columbia University terms as microaggression, these forms of subtle racism, subtle bullying. And this is an area that I'm quite interested in. So when I was sitting in the taxi on my way to the gym, I had a flurry of emotions, okay? I got pretty angry. I definitely wanted to get off, but I was running late. But I settled at pity. Because if there's any one thing that I truly felt is that I pitied his ignorance. Because he didn't know how important that question was to me. And it didn't seem like he cared. So when I got off, I told him, uh, and I'll keep this in English because it's fairly long and uh, not fairly pleasant to listen to. Uh, but I told him, I think I'm a Hong Konger and that's what I've learned from my time here. I don't know what you think, but frankly, I don't care. 10 points for politeness. <laughs> so, I was thinking, and I'm sure that gave it away, but I wasn't thinking about globalization. I wasn't thinking about ethnic minorities. I was thinking about Pokemon. I was still gymming, though. I, I insist, I was still gymming. All right, does anyone know what the tagline of Pokemon is? Gotta catch them all. Gotta catch them all. That's probably why we have a lot of investment bankers these days, don't you think? Yeah. 
<laughs> you've probably been playing too much Pokemon, yeah? But what's really special about Pokemon is that how people have responded to Pokemon. So some people love their uber strong legendary Pokemon. Okay, I, I love my super strong Pokemon as well. Yeah, I battle with them quite a bit. I'm still a Pokemaniac. I'm proud of it. No matter, don't, don't judge me. On the other hand, people like this Pokemon. It's called Magikarp. It's uh, Generation 1. It's probably the most pathetic Pokemon in terms of battle value. <laughs> but for some reason, people love it. So this is where that made me think, while I was still working out. Okay, the ironic juxtaposition between this. So, you know, how Pokemon are. They all have different colors, they're different species, different designs. Some Pokemon do some things better than other things. Some are faster, some more aggressive, some are better at defense. I could go on and on for hours, but I probably won't because that's another TED talk. But then, it made me think how each and every individual Pokemon still has its place. How each and every Pokemon is still given respect. How each and every monster is appreciated for design, for its characteristics, for anything at all. And never in a main series Pokemon game have we seen Pokemon discriminate against each other. So what does that make us think of ourselves as people? Yeah, I realize the problem with our society is that we label too much. We assign a label, and I've, I believe this labeling actually takes away more than actually it gives to us. This past summer, I, I learned this firsthand because, you know, as someone belonging to the healthcare sector, I do know the label that is how I look will forever result in me being challenged for my language ability, as, as Dominic alluded to earlier. But definitely one interesting point is that my exposure to the corporates, to the corporate sector, made me realize what I was labeling as well by myself. So I, uh, just to give you a bit of a, a context, um, I won a scholarship by an insurance company, a uh, pretty prestigious one and I worked at a multinational pharmaceutical firm. I expected to be challenged for how I look, I expected to be discriminated against, but I got none of that. So then I realized as someone from a healthcare, you know, I'm not a money person kind of guy. Um, these are the guys that everyone says does this, do this for social responsibility, to look good, it's a PR mechanic. I think it's more of an ethos of acceptance. And that's what I learned firsthand. I mean, there is discrimination every day around me. It happens in the university, but you know, a famous pop singer once said, but haters gonna hate, 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 hate. <laughs> no, I don't actually love her very much, but you know, it just made sense. So, these experiences left a huge mark on my mind. I mean, these people see the point, they see what they're doing, and I see absolutely nothing wrong. But, there's a caveat to all of this. Why I don't like being an ethnic minority, it's not really, I mean, I could do with more scholarship, sure, give, give them more, give me more, give me more. But it's the label, ethnic minority. Because it made it sound like more of a 10% versus 90% situation. I, I felt like I won it because I was part of the 10%. Although, uh, I'm told I could probably have won it anyway, but uh, that's, another, that's another story. But it makes you really think what the feeling is of being marginalized. What I hate most is actually the, the abbreviation, EM. I feel that's a crude way to describe a human being. So if you're a Hong Konger, I call you an HKGP, a Hong Kong, a Hong Kong person. Will that make any sense? Does that fully really describe you? Is that fair? Don't you have a name? Aren't you more than just a Hong Konger? Indeed, if we keep picking on these differences, if we keep looking at people as us and them, we can never solve this problem. I'll forever be a super legendary Pokemon. Someone else is always going to be Magic Carp. I'm always going to be better than you. That's not how it works. Just imagine in your lives, if there's a person that just walked by you and you just labeled him and walked on, too fat, I'm not going to talk to him. If you would have done that to someone and you would have missed out on this person, this person who could have added color, could have added interest, could have added spice like I'm doing to your life today, how much would you have missed out? Wouldn't, have, wouldn't it have been a shame? Of course, uh, nerd culture has taught me a lot more than that. Um, it's made me a more confident public speaker, I think. I don't know, you can, you can be the judge of that. Um, it's made me also actually become a bit of a feminist, you know? Um, yeah, I mean, if you have any cameras, please take a photo of this because this is the only time in my life I'm going to be standing next to these two ladies. <laughs> yeah, uh, really? 
So yeah, I mean, it's done more than help me with my identity crisis. It's made me learn a lot more about myself, how to express myself, and my views. In fact, a lot of it came from uh, Hayao Miyazaki films, uh, which I would recommend because these are films that do teach a lot of, uh, I mean, uh, that do have youth-centric stories, that do tell you that youth are around to make a difference. And it's, it's a coincidence that I speak about feminism here at LPC because an alumnus once told me over the phone, how can you be a feminist because you're a guy? I answered her by saying, now isn't that a bit too sexist? <laughs> As a thinker, anyway, this meme is known as pretty much my signature. I, use, I spam this everywhere. I'm sure a lot of you are thinking that this is fantasy. This is gobsmacked. This doesn't make any, any difference to my life. But as a thinker, I've grown, to, I've, I've grown to believe that dreams and reality are an infinite loop. Dreams are an extension of reality. Reality lies at the end of dreams. Without one, the other cannot exist. But I've always asked myself, which one I ought to pursue in my life? My ideals or my pragmatism? And then I ask the most youthful question possible. Why not both? <laughs> Being a youth to me has nothing to do with age. It has nothing to do with physical stature. It has to do with this rebellious view, this out-of-box nature, this wide-eyed perspective that you bring to the table every time you come out. This is unfortunately one thing I find to be dwindling around me. And as my hair grows gray, I don't know how long I can keep it up myself. You know, I'm a Steve Jobs fan, so uh, you know all you Apple nerds over there. You should probably know. I have to end with one more thing. That's the question. So I'd actually like to get a get a, get an idea of some of the answers um, to the question. Did anyone actually have any answers? What is the one thing you can live without? You'll never really live without. Can I have someone from there? Did you get any answers? <coughs> Seriously, nobody answered cheesecake? Chocolate. Chocolate. <laughs> what? I didn't hear that. Passion. Passion. Did you say passion? What did I hear that? Creativity. Creativity. Your phone. Uh, that's, that's a very honest answer. I'll give you that. I'll give you that. Wi Fi. Okay, yeah. Now we're talking about Maslow's needs, but that's another day. Actually, the question does have an answer because I actually wrote this by myself. The answer is death. What is the one thing you can live without but never really live without? So now you all know that I'm perpetually depressed. <laughs> um, but, but, that doesn't take any value away from each individual answer you have. All right? Because each answer you guys came up with instantaneously, I believe, is a projection of your identity. <coughs> what is the meaning of life? That's the one question even I can't answer, because frankly, the answer doesn't matter. The journey that you take to arrive at that answer is way more valuable than the answer itself. That's my firm belief. As a member of the youth myself, there are all these success stories. They're so intimidating. Oh, this guy, this person got to this position, blah, blah, blah. Dominic's at the, at the Liberal Party. He's so, so amazing, LPC alumnus. But I gotta tell you something, when you listen to these stories, you don't be intimidated by them. Because I assure you, there's something out there that each and every one of you can do, if not better than someone, then at least different than someone. Learn about yourself. Harness your talents. Harness your abilities. And that's the only way that I can tell you success. Because frankly, you only get one shot at life, guys. So make it the most decent one you've got. And as Mario would say, let's go. Thank you. <laughs>